Welcome everybody to Future Histories. My name is Jan Groß and today you'll hear a recording of a panel I organized and moderated in February 2020 as part of my research fellowship at the Weizenbaum Institute for the Networked Society. The panel critically discusses the expansion of crypto economics into an art of government and I am very happy that I was able to bring together Jaya Clara Brecke, Benjamin Seibel and Martin Köppelmann as panelists. Jaya and Benjamin have both been guests to Future Histories before, so check out their episodes as well. I'd like to send my warmest thanks and greetings to the Research Group 17 at the Weizenbaum Institute who hosted my stay there. And greetings actually to everybody at the Weizenbaum because I really, really, really enjoyed my stay there and I loved the many interesting and inspiring discussions. It was an actually perfect research environment i have to say so thanks a lot and since i am uh, actually already in the mode of wholehearted gratitude i'd like to thank ludwig and welcome him as a patron of future histories and i'd like to thank vicky fabian and bernhard for their contributions thanks a thousand times this really helps a lot but now please enjoy the panel dime and punishment Crypto economics as an art of government. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to host this panel tonight uh, with this awesome guest, <laughs> which I'm really excited about to bring together. It's Jaya Clara Brecke, Benjamin Seibel, and Martin Köppelbahn. Uh, maybe you could introduce yourself just a little. Uh, sure. Um Hello everyone, I'm Jaya. <laughs> uh, I have been kind of tracing the emergence of the field of crypto economics um, pretty much since the beginning of Ethereum. Um, I started writing a PhD that was a political analysis of blockchain. Um, I wanted to understand how can you understand something like blockchain politically. Um, and that was right around the time when Ethereum uh, had its first DevCon. Um, And so for me, it's been kind of a curious journey of understanding the ways that, I guess, like uh, uh, kind of existing or kind of historical economic theories are rehashed and reconfigured through the development of protocols that actually come from a very different set of concerns, namely usually kind of uh, security questions, network security questions. So this kind of like interesting mishmash and the emergence of crypto economics as a field that's kind of distinct from um, uh, previous uh, economic ideas. Um, that's, I guess, like uh, broadly my interest, but um, uh, in relation to this panel anyway. Um, but yeah, within that, I also kind of look more at, I guess, power dynamics, questions of governance, this kind of thing too. Um, that's a brief. I'm also, I, so right now I'm, I'm uh, doing a postdoc at Durham University, but I am on strike today, so I do not represent <laughs> Durham University. They're not paying me to be here. Um, I'm here as a general interested uh, person that, um, you know, is, is kind of following um, this field and right. Uh, writes a lot about this field, speaks a lot about this field, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, hi, I'm Benjamin. Um, I, uh, well, Jan uh, invited me here <laughs> as, a, I guess, an expert on governmental technologies um, because I wrote a book about it a few years ago, um, a, a PhD thesis about uh, cybernetics, actually, and the influence it had on governmental discourses, in the post-war periods, like from 1945 to 1970, basically. So very early, uh, the, the emergence of digital technologies, but also of a kind of theoretical discourse around these technologies and how it influenced um, <laughs> politics and governmental thinking in this period. And I think we still see the consequences of these developments today, or maybe we even see them uh, just today uh, more than, uh, than in the past. Um, anyway, I um, no longer work in academia and I'm also not an expert on crypto economics, but Jan told me that is just fine. Um, <laughs> so I hope um, I still can contribute something to the discussion. I work in, in civic tech and technology activism basically here in Berlin for about five years now. Uh, also work a lot with the government uh, on um, digital developments and how to implement these technologies in a way that benefits citizens. 
Ja, ja I'm Martin Köppelmann, um, yeah, background, I'm a software engineer uh, and interested in blockchain, first uh, Bitcoin eight, eight years ago or something like that, uh, and then mainly Ethereum. Um, I founded the project uh, or company now uh, called Gnosis. Uh, we are building um, prediction markets uh, and a bunch of other infrastructure and markets uh, uh, on Ethereum. Um, yeah, kind of uh, another side side project I initiated uh, is a project called Circles, um, where we're trying to um, advance the cause of uh, universal basic income uh, via um, blockchain technology and introducing new uh, new currencies. Um, yeah, I hope. Uh, somehow, the, I, I, for, for me, it totally made sense to bring together all these these specific people, actually. And uh, the umbrella is uh, the title of this panel tonight, Diamond Punishment, Crypto Economics as an Art of Government. I'm quite sure that not everybody is familiar with the topic, so I think we, we should kind of uh, lay out some basic thoughts about it. Maybe let's uh, simply start with the definition of, of crypto economics. Jaya, maybe you want to start? Um, yes, well, I guess, uh, you know, I'm not going to give you a kind of like little spiffy one-liner, but more um, just to say that um, I guess the easiest way to describe uh, crypto economics is to trace it back to Bitcoin mining, basically. And the idea of using, you know, on a very basic level, economic incentives and rewards in order to achieve certain uh, network security characteristics in a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network scenario. Um, and that is like, you know, uh, that's been done, you know, that's kind of been a, a, a kind of field of experimentation ever since then um, and has added more and more economic concepts, more and more ideas around how markets function and so on that I'm sure Martin can say a lot more about in terms of the practical experiments that's been done around that. But um, I think for me, what's interesting about uh, that is that, you know, I come from a background, a, a kind of theoretical and political background that's extremely critical of the use of markets in trying to kind of um, govern social relations. Um, And I remain very critical of that. You know, I think there's a, a, a severe limitation to what markets uh, can and should do in, in societies. Um, nevertheless, I think it's like a super interesting field to look at how it interacts exactly with network security and network security protocols. Um, and so, you know, I follow these experiments with, with lots of interest and openness too. I think one, one of the, the reasons why I'm interested in, uh, in crypto economics as an art of government is a kind of more or less recent development where these uh, types of actually design, these design paradigms of crypto economics uh, reach over into the sphere of the social even more and are proclaimed to become a new social technology. There's this uh, collaboration between Vitalik Buterin, one of the founders of uh, Ethereum, uh, one of the largest uh, mm -hmm. blockchain platforms, and an economist called Glenn Whale, and they kind of joined forces and more or less tried to develop, tried to develop a what they call political theory based on radical markets, which are actually markets based on mechanism design and um, yeah, actually mostly on, on mechanism design, which is a type of game theoretical thinking. And uh, the combination with uh, blockchain technology and crypto economics. And this is proclaimed to become a new social technology, which can uh, create uh, some kind of legitimacy within a space of anonymity. And um, before the mm -hmm. panel, that, that's, the, that's the idea, can roughly. Uh, I'm not sure about the, in, yeah. in that, in that, uh, in that particular context, I'm not sure about the anonymity, I think. Like yeah, that's in, true. In that case, Actually, they yes. very clearly say we need identity and uh, one person, one vote and stuff like that. But Yeah, yeah. it's true. Well, I'm uh, kind of um, uh, um, uh, making this, this uh, <coughs> um, uh, longer uh, introduction is, I'd be keen on your position of what you mm -hmm. think that crypto economics actually is, because when we were talking yeah. before the panel, you kind of sketched it in yeah. a kind of broader sense, uh, also political sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, again, I, I have not really thought, or it, it's, I 
guess just just feeling it's it's not uh, not trying to to define those terms, but a few few things that that come to my mind when I when I think about it is uh, first of all that we have a space um, where there there is no um, yeah arbitrator or judge. So like like if we are here uh, interacting with each other. Um, there's always the assumption whatever we do there is a state and there is something above us um, and, uh, and and if we do some form of interaction if I go into a shop uh, and, and, and buy something then then the interaction is not just defined but by by the two of us uh, but it's defined by a whole construct uh, above us um, and in those blockchain in the blockchain world um, we're trying to make interactions between possible uh, we are trying to make interactions between people uh, possible even in the absence of such an overarching um, um, state uh, and the very uh, um, uh, practical uh, consequences is that something as simple as um, as having 10 people that are somewhere in the world in let's say 10 different countries And they together want to have a bank account. So they together want to say, okay, we have here $1,000 and we want to uh, control that together. That would be extremely uh, complex to set up outside of um, a blockchain. I mean, you could, couldn't, um, I mean, you could, I guess, form a company, but that would need to be in one jurisdiction. And then it would, be, it would cost you thousands, maybe $10,000 to just, maybe much more to set up such a construct. Um, in blockchain world, that's super easy and costs you 20 cents. Um, so you can just do what's called multi-sig, uh, some, th some shared account that's, uh, that where the money sits uh, and it's controlled by, um, by, by 10 people. Uh, and there can be basic rules, like if five of those 10 agree, um, then the money can be, uh, can be taken. And um, so I, I would define crypto economics as a space that uh, can enforce rules Without without such a government arbitrator, um, that of course has um, yeah consequences. Or like one is that it's always an opt in. So in in my view, so far, um, uh, yeah, if if I'm born in Germany, I I don't have a choice to kind of uh, pay taxes or not. Kind of I'm I'm kind of forced to uh, play by the rules that he uh, that they are, um, that that exist here. Uh, I would say so far in crypto economics, it's always. An active decision to kind of, um, yeah, put something under those rules, uh, which comes with the flip side that you usually first have to um, put something in, uh, kind of, which means m mainly you have to first put in value. So uh, unless you put in value or money or something money-like, uh, usually you will not be able to um, um, to do. Uh, to do anything but yeah. i mean that, then there are maybe a few more so so i, I think the um what you mentioned was was game theory i would maybe call it adversarial thinking so like when um when those systems are designed i think the general mindset is um uh that they we try to build systems that work under worst case assumptions Uh, so if I would just um, make try to make one real world example, uh, I think that like in in, in the U.S. Uh, there were there were those primaries or, or U uh, the the Democratic primaries, and and I think there was a mess up uh, like that they couldn't count the votes, uh, and and someone designing a crypto economic system would immediately say, okay, it's basically just those two guys who then report to that. That's a terrible system. That's kind of just those two guys. They would enough to collude. So, so we would kind of just from the mindset directly come with a different mindset and, and come with a mindset that tries to build systems that are more uh, resilient, I guess. Yeah. That's very interesting. And I think because we will we'll come to a, a, a part of critique, actually, and I'll be <laughs> keen on, on looking and, uh, uh, at, the, at the assumptions, the anthropologies, uh, so to speak, that are uh, inscribed within this, this type of thinking, uh, because to me, it's even kind of uh, 
paranoid somehow <laughs> and then that's uh, specifically problematic when it comes to designing social spaces you know if you mm -hmm. always think that the next guy might stab you in the back yeah but mm -hmm. um, um, I, I want to, to be more generous actually <laughs> towards mm -hmm. the whole thing before we get there I'd like to, to ask uh, Benjamin to maybe introduce us to the second part of the title because it's uh, Diamond Punishment Cryptic Economics as an Art of Government in German that would be Regierungskunst And uh, Benjamin actually uh, wrote uh, quite a lot about uh, the question of technology in relation to Regierungskunst. Could you maybe uh, kind of uh, uh, brief us about it? I could try, yeah. It's, it's already hard to sum up a book in a few sentences, yes. but when it's been five I years, it's even one. harder. You know? <laughs> but, uh, no, when, when I started to write about like, the relation of technology and government, I found that on the one hand you would um, throughout the history of, of political or governmental thinking you would always find these metaphors or models of machinery as the state so even like in in, in past centuries you would find these conceptions of the state being like a ship or like a clockwork or like mm. a steam engine uh, and in the 20th century of course this gets replaced by uh, looking at the state as kind of an information processing system or look uh, at societies as kind of information processing systems And these models have kind of a very bad reputation in political uh, thinking, especially in like leftist political thinking, because they always look very reductionist, um, which they are, of course. Uh, so uh, lots of very smart political thinkers actually assumed that these models were just wrong, um, which I found not satisfying because it was so obvious that these models actually had an, a, a huge impact um, on the way that Uh, government was thought but also how government was practiced because mm -hmm. these technologies are not just like ideas they are like materialities that can also be used as tools um, to actually govern people because governing people and this is an idea that you will find in, in Foucault uh, most prominently is a very technological thing to do in a mm -hmm. way uh, it's about control it's about regulation it's about setting environments where people can be regulated uh, in some way and of course those people in power or governments um, can also use technologies as actual tools. So it's not just like we imagine society to be an information network, but once you imagine society to be an information network, you can use computers or information networks to actually you know, start controlling people through computers. <laughs> uh, the same way that, for example, um, um, Friedrich der Große, Frederick uh, the Great, uh, tried to imagine his state as a clockwork and control the people um, through discipline in a way like a clock works. Um, so um, what I realized was that, that technologies or technological assemblages, which is more than just the artifacts, you know, also the knowledge surrounding it and so on, um, that they offer spaces of possibility um, through which you can attempt to control a society, for example. Um, which is always attempted, you know, because a government in a way always tries to be at the state of the art of governing. Uh, so always trying to implement new technologies to try new forms in regulating people better uh, or worse. Um, uh, so you have these spaces of possibilities that then also shape kind of your, your thinking on how you frame the problem, you know, because for government, society is a problem to be controlled. Mm -hmm. um, And the way how you, how you look at this problem, um, um, how you look at society is very much influenced um, from the technical uh, conditions under which you actually operate. Um, so that's what I kind of observed, how this, this image um, changed and moved to, to looking at societies as information systems or communication systems, but also looking at uh, individuals as being rational actors, you know, the whole homo economicus uh, model, basically like computers. Um, how you started to look at individuals as self-regulating actors, lots like a cybernetic machine that works through feedback mechanisms. And, um, and then you, you start experimenting with, with this framework and with the possibilities that arise and try to figure out new ways of, of governing. And uh, I think in this, in this context, um, the whole blockchain thing that is often framed by evangelists as being something very disruptive and very revolutionary is actually just a logical like next step that is still in the same framework um, like the cybernetic discourse of the 1950s was and in, in that sense it's it's not very revolutionary uh, which doesn't make it good or bad you know it's just um, 
I, I would argue to, to look at it in a, in a longer time span. But still there would be the question, uh, what specific type of new realm of possibilities is opened up through this technology? Because I said I, that I want to be a, a bit more generous. I think there is something being yeah, opened I mean, up. I mean, my, my, my immediate response here would be, <coughs> my, my perspective would be quite the opposite. So you, you said something like uh, governments want to uh, basically control or uh, govern people. Uh, well, to me, blockchain is really uh, the possibility of people to cooperate without the government. So um, to control so themselves, basically, to which self, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah to uh, yeah. So so uh, just um, one one thing uh, we are well <laughs> dreaming of or, or working on is uh, there are probably uh, a million or more people on the world uh, that care about uh, climate change, um, and they have no good way to uh, to coordinate. It kind of there is no good. Uh, Yeah, as, as mentioned earlier, like as soon as you do something international, companies or fine or whatever. I mean, what 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 would you do? So um, so uh, so to build to build that, that level of coordination that is independent of of existing uh, power structures, namely states and large uh, corporations. Um, yeah, that 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 is the thing that that uh, is, is 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 promising to me and. Well, in the last consequence, it could mean uh, uh, getting rid of states. But so I would say there is a revolution, uh, revolutionary potential. Uh, but but anyhow, yeah. I think for me, what's been kind of curious has been the way that uh, blockchain and kind of the the idea of decentralization that is advanced through blockchain tends to very much be about. Like it's it's a very different way of thinking about revolution because the the transformation is less about a kind of qualitative transformation as in let's do things fundamentally differently and more about let's decentralize all the existing ways of doing things so people can do that for themselves but in a decentralized way and that like for me is a bit curious like I you know there is there is a difference there like there is a difference between lots of individuals like running their own kind of currencies and their own kind of like uh, banks mm -hmm. um, and kind of centralized banks like that's a huge difference mm -hmm. but nevertheless the kinds of the actual technologies tend to be very much like a replication of, of the, the existing ways of thinking about money value government um, and you know there are some experimentation at the edges but it seems a little bit like there's you know and again I don't you know I'm kind of like, it, it's, it's sometimes very much a critique of mine, like a very strong critique in the very specific projects, but other times it's also an openness as in like, that's, that's curious. I don't actually know what that means, like in terms of how it would play out, you know what I mean? Um, but there is a little bit this thing of like, um, uh, there is not a kind of strong uh, conceptual critique of the state or the banking industry um, Uh, as much as it's just centralized and we need to decentralize. So like we look at what they're doing and what they're doing, they're doing, you know, specific things that instead of them doing it, we want everyone to be able to do it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, on a side note, the, the idea of getting rid of the state is like a key idea in cybernetic yeah. governmental yeah. thinking, yes. like the, the, in a perfectly controlled social system, you wouldn't need a state because everything would just keep exactly. everything in itself. check. Um, so I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm very fond of the also like the positive or utopian ideas that, that are in there. But what interests me is, aren't we substituting one form of control to another form of control? And how does this new form of control look like? Or how can we, what do we do with it? Like 10 years ago, the idea was blockchain decentralizes everything. And now it's like Facebook uses a blockchain to kind of decentralize everything, but still keep control of everything with Libra, you know. Um, so, so I think there's just a lot of work and academic work to do in trying to understand and grasp these, um, these decentralized power structures or even how new uh, centralized power structures might emerge from it because that's what we learned uh, from the internet of the last like 30 years a, a huge like utopian and emancipatory potential in the 90s and we were all like everything gets decentralized and we get rid of the old power structures and now look at the internet today i mean what happened so and i think just we we, we need to work really hard to understand 
how decentralized power uh, works. Yeah, no, I mean, to some extent, uh, it's it's a uh, well, it's a technology or technological pieces that can be used in, in quite quite a range of ways. So, uh, you you mentioned kind of um, uh, like money or the, there is this this project maker uh, on, on on Ethereum, which I would say kind of replicates how today a uh, um, uh, central bank works to some extent um, and but at the end it's, yeah it's maybe not that different so it's um, it's okay maybe it's uh, 20 token large token holders that then vote and instead of well the central bank where I don't know maybe seven people then at the end make the decision so, <laughs> so in that sense it's, it's not really that different but uh, but but blockchain also or the, the technology just opens up the field for uh, for for much more experiments. So there is this maker, but there are also a hundred other uh, currencies or currency systems or value systems um, that 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 are currently being built and uh, yeah experimented. So. Uh, and not only that, there's also loads of experimentation in terms of governance, right? I mean, sure, because yeah, like, course, course. And, and, and I mean, not just in terms of kind of governance, like blockchain applications for governance, but more like, like the governance of blockchain protocols mm. is wild. <laughs> like mm. there's so many problems that keep coming up, no? Sure. And that's like an ongoing, that for me is the real stuff. Because that for me, like, first of all, has to do with this question of like, okay, we're, we're arranging a kind of new decentralized protocol um, where what the, what happens to power in the meantime um, and a lot of that has to do with who determines you know whether the protocol is considered to work or be good or not and what need what changes need to be made so far like you know in terms of any kind of uh, radical changes to protocols that has to sit within a kind of like attack vector uh, scenario so it's like if you want to uh, modify the way that a given network is is governed, then it needs to be coded into kind of attack vector type language, and then it's something that can actually be dealt with by developers in a sensible way. Um, but the more kind of like the questions of how the protocols actually meet users in you know in their day to day lives, and how users then push back on whether that protocol is actually performing something good in their lives or not, is like a, a still an open question mark in many ways. Um, Again, so far, like, you know, uh, there's been, you know, the hacks and the exploits and so on. And that's like, you know, been the kind of interesting cases um, of what do you do then? Uh, uh, you know, who has the control of, of the protocol then? And then, of course, like forking as a governance mechanism around that. But yeah, and there's lots of in interesting <laughs> stuff happening right now, no, in terms of, of protocol governance in the space. I'm still at the point of trying to be generous. Uh, I'm still asking myself, what exactly is the thing that crypto economics brings to the table? You know, uh, if you consider all the critique, if you consider that, like, apart from all the bullshit, apart from all the hype, apart from all the, um, okay, they are using, uh, like, uh, rational choice assumptions and, and, and everything, is there still something left that opens up new spaces of possibilities, as, as you mentioned in relation to the, the question of technology as an art of government. And, and I'm asking this from a perspective of being like really uh, critical towards all the, uh, the, the things. My, my simple, you, simplest, say, simplest answer would again be uh, uh, it enables people to co cooperate uh, uh, across jurisdictions worldwide in a form that was previously not possible. But can we go into that cooperation a little bit more? Because, mm -hmm. like, you know, obviously people can call each other, mm -hmm. right? And, mm -hmm. and like, if you, you know, you can call someone and organize something, right. you know, between lots of different sure. locations. Sure. So it's a very specific kind of cooperation or collaboration that is enabled through blockchain. Not because, like, communication happens already. Oh, yeah. Relationships can be established. People can make agreements and so on and so forth. Um, it is. It's more sp specific than that, right? Well, of course, yeah. Again, I, I, um, one one example, the simplest example is just like having control of a budget together. Yeah. Um, that already is pretty hard to do, I would say. Um, and then you can, of course, go go on from there. But just as a 
Um, so yeah, again, this climate change thing. So there, uh, there is a project Dao Stake I'm in, in somewhat involved with, where um, the idea is yeah, you, there are Facebook groups today with mil million or sometimes hundred thousand million people that are interested in some topic or something like that. Um, but the group is very. Um, but those groups could maybe do much more than or yeah could 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 uh, have a much higher impact. So imagine. Um, you would pay a, a one dollar a month uh, membership kind of into this group, and then this group would have a budget and would have some uh, procedures how to um, well then actually be able to to spend that money. Um, I have a hard time imagining that how to do this today, kind of how how to set that up um, uh, without blockchain. Mm -hmm. So that's some specific financial application. That can be created through this technology because if you if you take it to a, a larger level of uh, climate change, yeah. I'm not I'm not seeing how this is like uh, how addressing climate change. Well, I mean, more green, cooperation like Greenpeace is does that, right? Greenpeace that people pay a membership fee to Greenpeace and then they do stuff on climate, and people see that as a kind of coordinating mechanism. And I mean, I get what you're saying that like. It, it's you know you can kind of it's easier for smaller groups to self-organize that might not have access to uh, be able to have a bank account and so on and so forth but like there is like the big question here is what is it that you know the fact that Greenpeace does this versus like another set of people like it, you know there is a set of kind of governance and legal jurisdictions and all that which is like It can be good, but it can be bad. But sometimes it is quite good. And especially when like a given protocol gets hacked, it's quite good. <laughs> Or like, do you know what I mean? Like there's kind of sometimes there's like a fallback onto kind of uh, existing legal systems um, and existing governance systems. That's like, man, uh, people kind of. Oh, okay. I mean, I would say that that's um, then the second next. I mean, like, we, if we are still at the basis of what do we actually or what, what's the promise, then yeah. I, I would say, uh, well, why not Greenpeace? Yeah, I mean, again, the 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 uh, the uh, I, I don't know how uh, Greenpeace is structured legally uh, globally. I assume they have uh, in many jurisdictions some some entities, and I think it has overall probably a tremendous costs and just maintaining that legal structure so so that's uh, that would simply be uh, enormous reduction of of um, costs of, of setting up uh, such a structure and then of course uh, the the imagination is that it's uh, much more particip uh, participatory um, so so instead of just kind of uh, paying a membership fee uh, to Greenpeace uh, and then I think I, I Not a member, but I assume you don't have kind of direct voting rights on on stuff and how how, how that money is is spent. Um, and I would say that is also because it's just uh, complicated and expensive to set those structures up. And I would say with uh, with this technology uh, that those costs to set up, yeah. Governments, government, uh, govern, governance structures uh, can be reduced significantly, and uh, um, and and that makes it just possible to do things that were previously not possible. So, one example I, I sometimes bring in just how the reduction of costs uh, introduces new things is um, uh, the internet reduced, of course, the, uh, the costs of submitting information uh, tremendously. So. Uh, so, like twenty years ago, if you want, if you wanted to express something as, or thirty years ago, if you wanted to express something as, um, yeah, uh, unimportant as you like this picture, well, you would not write a letter to someone and say I like this picture. With with Facebook, of course, you click the like button, and that's kind of one example of the cost of submitting this information was reduced by a factor of a thousand or a million, um, and and with blockchain technology. The costs of um, submit not submitting information, but submitting transactions. So sending a token or set, send, um, casting a vote that can trigger something, or kind of this transactional cost is reduced by a factor or can be reduced by a factor of, of a million, and yeah, that will open up a new uh, new space. 
I mean, don't get me wrong. It's not that I don't think there's anything interesting about that. I think there's plenty of interesting things. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in the space. But it's more that I I find it kind of problematic that there is a lot of kind of discussions that tend to happen in and around blockchain where it's like, oh, that would be ne- that would never be possible without blockchain, or oh, that would you know when actually yes, things are possible. It just is a different way of doing things, and so there's a tendency to often kind of reduce social interactions to a kind of like very limited set of forms of interactions um, and kind of reinterpret the whole world through that lens. And that's a little bit like, man, come on, you know, <laughs> like yeah. um, including things like, uh, uh, n- no, sorry, I'll stop there because we'll get into that later, I'm sure. <laughs> Questions of the state and sovereignty and all this kind of stuff, I think. Yeah, I, I mean, I, st- I think we're still in, in a very early stage where we just where it's important to also explore the possibilities yeah. and try out different things. Um, for me, um, as a non-expert, the promise uh, of blockchain technologies kind of lies in the possibility to design economic systems mm-hmm. um, down to a very micro-transactional level and day-to-day level even. And I think there's huge possibilities, also uh, huge problems there. But in theory, it's uh, lots of interesting things is possible. It's not only that like tax evasion is no longer possible, but... Maybe also it's no longer possible to spend money on things that, you know, harm other people or harm the environment or maybe it's more expensive or maybe it's more expensive tomorrow than it is today. Um, there's, as I said, there are lots of problems come with it. But in theory, like compared to how our economic system works now, um, you can control things on a much tighter level for good or for worse. No? I mean, on, on that specific thing, um, uh, I think it will tax evasion will become in a way also much easier again. Uh, there are those zero knowledge proofs and uh, or the, I mean like so far blockchain has been very very I mean, yeah. very transparent. So um, so uh, but but there is already the technology ready to make blockchain or to make transactions that are uh, yeah shielded or, or like that that you cannot uh, you have a very very hard uh, time tracing from the outside uh, what's going on yes uh, but i think i think what benjamin is actually heading at is that it's a design question that that uh, again coming from his book uh, uh, these these technologies open up spaces and it's a it's a question of a political uh, conversation a political uh, Ausverhandeln? I don't know. Negotiation. Negotiation. Thanks a lot. Um, um, what we, uh, how we want to use this this contingent space of possibility that is being opened up, and um, I think that that one of the one of the problems actually in the in the space uh, is that the way that the the question is looked upon is informed through lenses that I personally mo- mostly do not uh, do not share I specifically in crypto economics there's this lens of game theoretic design a, a game theoretic design perspective and I'd like to talk a bit about this because this actually like um, builds the floor up on which the the rest is then being um, like imagined actually and to me it's it's like highly flawed Maybe I, I, I mention a, an author, Ariel Rubinstein, and he's a, he's actually a renowned economist in the field of crypto, uh, of not crypto economics, but game theory. Mm-hmm. And he wrote a book. It's called Economic Fables, and he talks about game theory from a perspective where he says, "All right, I really, really enjoyed game theory as an intellectual pleasure in my professional life, but when it comes to real world applicability, I highly doubt that it's worth anything." when it comes to the prediction of real behavior of humans, because it's just not a, a tool that you can use for this. And then what you end up with is a, a normative uh, idea of how people should behave. And this I, I uh, often find in uh, crypto economic systems design, that you imagine a way of how you would like that people should behave. And this is mostly thought of as um, uh, like strictly rational, profit maximizing, and uh, and actually alongside uh, idea of, of of rational choice theory, and that's how it's modeled. And then you build a system that tries to kind of force people uh, to act in this ways with a with a with a type of carrot and stick approach. I would say that's how it seems. To I, me, I would say right? quite the opposite. I, I oh, would I, I would say yes. I would say uh-huh. you imagine how people could behave worst case. <laughs> 
Uh, and yeah, then you, you imagine and, how they, oh, yeah. Yeah, so, second. so you imagine how the others could behave worst case uh, to you and then you de de design the system that even if they all behave worst case uh, for you it kind of still works <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean the, that, and that is the security engineer's perspective and that yeah. i find really interesting to, to trace through actually but there is something else that you said which was uh the intellectual pleasure of, of game theory right mm -hmm. and i actually i honestly think that blockchain has become so big because it's intellectually pleasurable <laughs> <laughs> like i you know it's just it it put it puts forward a whole bunch of really interesting problems for political theorists for economists for mathematicians, for cryptographers, for computer engineers, you know, it's just an interesting set of problems to attack. Um, whether those problems are actual real world problems or not, it's like, eh, you know, maybe, maybe yeah. not. Okay. Um, but like, honestly, I, you know, I feel that, that, that's, that that's the case. Um, uh, but yeah, in terms of the assumptions um, of game theory, like, you know, game theory is kind of like one, you know, big component in, in crypto economics. Um, but there is like something that I've been trying to think through and, and struggle with a little bit is this question of like, um, exactly as Martin was saying, like whether, you know, there is an element of uh, the kind of core engineering where, you know, modeling, you know, being so focused on modeling attacks makes sense because you want the kind of core engineering to be secure fundamentally, right? When it becomes problematic is when that becomes a kind of like model and a lens for understanding all social relationships and, and kind of expanding from there a kind of worldview and a political view. And that happens for some reason or another very quickly in the blockchain space. Um, but I did, I did a little, when I was writing my PhD, I, I was running through a little, I did a little kind of experiment where I was trying to kind of work through the concept of trustlessness, which is like a major kind of like concept in the blockchain space and in crypto, uh, crypto economics. Um, you know, and trustlessness kind of defines a kind of threshold um, of trust that is required in order for the system to function securely. So there's a famous kind of 51% attack and all these kinds of things where, you know, how many nodes in the network would need to collude in order for the network to then become, you know, uh, biased or owned or, or whatever else. Um, and, and what I wanted to understand was like the way that trust and trustlessness was under, you know, was kind of conceptualized and worked with in a very rigorous way amongst computer engineers, um, and yet for anyone actually engaging with the with blockchain systems and crypto economic systems and so on, um, a lot of trust is required, right? Like you need to kind of like trust what you've read on a website. You need to trust, you know, the exchange rates on on a kind of crypto exchange and so on and so forth. Like you, you're never as an individual able to run, go through, you know, all the GitHub code repositories in order to make sure that everything is super secure. Like you actually need to trust a lot of people to engage with these systems. So where is it that that kind of like mythical trustlessness that blockchain provides and the actual social reality where a lot of trust is, is required, where does that meet and how is that articulated? And that's exactly the kind of like, areas where, you know, then you do start to see a lot of scams and you do see, start to see a lot of kind of um, uh, security breaches and so on. Um, but it's, it's a kind of, it, I think it's also one of the reasons why it, the kind of security protocol so quickly becomes a political and social imagination because you're trying to produce, you, you know, the, the effort of the security engineers to try to produce something that is, uh, uh, you know, stable as a kind of, political, social, legal, and economic system um, uh, through cryptography and through math, right? Um, and so, you know, the more that you see that it doesn't play out that way in reality, the more you need to bring reality into, into those kind of conditions of trustlessness, the more you need to kind of like add more things onto the blockchain, you know, like put it out into IoT and, you know, get more and more because everything outside of the trustless network is just, is, you know, dodgy potentially, right? Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sorry, a little rant. <laughs> I think also from a broader perspective, this, this point of trust is, is super interesting mm. to me because maybe that's even the key um, behind the whole blockchain thing is, is it tries to, to replace a social mechanism of trust that has a long history uh, with a technological mechanism, mm -hmm. uh, which, which makes sense in a way, but trust in social relations like... I learned that from Niklas Luhmann, I think, is a, is a mechanism to reduce complexity. Right? Um, 
And once you remove that social mechanism, you set free a lot of, of potential complexity yeah. uh, that yeah. you have to deal with on a, on a technological right? level because you can abstract all, all that away yeah. if you just trust a person. You know? yeah, I exactly. have right now, I have a babysitter at home. Yeah? I trust her to bring my kid to sleep at around now probably, 7 or 7.30. Uh, I could also set up a, a, a smart contract with her, you know. If, if the baby monitor says you're not exactly. down at 7.30, you're not getting paid. But is that really better? Um, and Or does it just uh, so much possible complexity emerges out of this because maybe she has a good reason not to put it down at 7.30 but maybe at 7.40 and then the smart contract would you know not work and then we have to fix it afterwards and so much complexity that I can just abstract away by just trusting that person that she's a good person she will do a good job and lots of social relationships work yeah. this way by trust and we have to be very careful which ones we want to replace and which ones we want to keep I think that it works perfectly fine in, 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 in the, the babysitter use case but in the use case where you want to build something uh, yeah kind of a global platform or, or kind of potentially something with millions of, of, of people uh, involved uh, I uh, think it, it yeah, simply doesn't work that uh, that uh, there are those personal trust relationships uh, that, that that make the whole thing um, uh, work together or, or at least there will come clear limitations um, and uh, and like just a very practical example where I very much value this, this trustlessness is um, in, yeah, in, in, in Ethereum there are all those um, different projects that, that build pieces, kind of Lego pieces that, that you can then uh, yeah, build, build, build more complex uh, applications together. And it very much makes for us a difference whether one piece um, is, uh, has something like an operator and, and kind of someone who could change the rules Uh, and where we would need to trust them and kind of need to make sure that they will not change it in our uh, in a way we don't like it and then kind of the whole thing we we are building uh, has a problem because one piece here um, is is now acting in a different way or uh, a piece uh, with with no operator uh, with with no way to to change it what we would call trustless um, and 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 if you have those those trustless Puzzle pieces, uh, yeah. Well, the hope is that you, it allows you to to build much more robust uh, and complex uh, complex systems. Many times, I find myself actually really very much agreeing with the, the definition of the of the problem. You know, also when I read uh, Glenn Whale and Vitalik Buterin's uh, some some text about the radical markets, I really, 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 really do not agree with the solutions that they provide. But when they come to define the problems, they're actually quite clear on, on, on how to describe uh, the ways in which uh, contemporary structures, political structures, uh, are actually not, uh, or oftentimes not, not uh, anymore convincing in the way they address the, the overall uh, changing, um, I don't know, landscape of things <laughs> to be very unprecise you know so so there is this open question on how uh, how can we uh, do things differently there are many interesting uh, uh, problems that are being talked about in the space and one of the questions would be in which case is is the way that are being uh, that they are being approached from the crypto economics perspective for example is uh, adequate and in which case uh, it is not um Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> you want to say well, something? I don't want to, if, you, if you're in no, 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 no. kind of arrive at a no, topic please, or something. No, please, I was trying to think what I would <laughs> say next, so please go ahead. No, just to say <laughs> that, like, I don't know, for me, in, in like, my work and, and interests is kind of like, you know, I'm not so intensely focused on, you know, whether crypto economics and blockchain is, like, are the solutions to things, but, yeah. what, but I do think that they have done a lot to put the right questions on the table, right? And to, uh, and to open up a lot more possibility for experimentation and especially in two areas like especially when it comes to to currencies and currency design and questions of value and money um, at all scales really you know the you know both in terms of a kind of global money all the way down to local and uh, this kind of thing um, and uh, questions of privacy um, and I think you know questions of privacy is something that unfortunately is like 
his kind of, to me, it seems like it's, it's seeped a little bit into the background in recent kind of blockchain world. Um, you know, like, okay, it turns out Bitcoin isn't anonymous. Okay, fine. You know, anonymity and privacy are, are, are slightly different things. Um, but I think privacy is super interesting and super important um, in a kind of like increasingly digitally mediated world, also in terms of questions of, of governance in the state, right? So, you know, we no longer have like James Scott seeing like a state, there's no longer a kind of, it's not exactly a panopticon that we're living in anymore, is it? Um, it's a kind of different scenario, a kind of like algorithmic visibility that's a lot more nebulous, um, a lot more contingent, um, a lot harder to kind of like point your finger exactly at where the power is. Um, and I think like the que questions of kind of privacy within that and the kind of added building blocks that uh, blockchain technology promises in terms of currency design, governance structures and so on. There are interesting ways then to kind of recreate, you know, how you want to organize as a community in different levels and in different kind of scales. Um, and I don't see this as a, in any way a kind of absolute thing. It's not like replacing the state with something else because we actually live in a super complex patchwork of sovereignties already. Um, I was reading a, super, a really interesting paper earlier today on uh, water governance um, and uh, indigenous sovereignties in the states versus the, the kind of federal. Um, and they, there's a kind of coexistence, right? Um, and that coexistence is... Uh, uh, is not just like, you know, Native Americans are doing the same thing as kind of federal uh, government. Um, it's like they're doing things very, very differently, but they're governing water or they're, do you know what I mean? So it's like these qualitatively, like qualitatively different ways of doing things and the ability to determine that. Yeah, just, just like one note on the privacy question. Uh, blockchain really brings both ends, ends of the spectrum. So yeah, it brings, exactly. It brings the full kind of everything is verifiable, everything is visible, every transaction is, uh, but it also has a spectrum and it's, to me still totally unclear kind of where we will end. It also brings uh, brings the other spectrum and that's more recent developments with zero knowledge proofs, but, or whatever technology that, that really allows you uh, or plausibly could allow you uh, total anonymity uh, and, and, uh, and no, and, 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 Like you could do things, you know, tax evasion would be super easy. You could uh, you could do um, you could also yeah pay or, or um, well incentivize specific behavior, and no one would or, or kind of there's quite a bit of scary things that that are possible on that uh, end of the spectrum. Um, and yeah, I don't know where we where, where we will end. Can I ask a blunt question to yeah. you as, as experts? Because we, I think we can all agree that that uh, crypto is a challenge for state actors, but is it a challenge for capitalism? Like, um, would you think that the, or is that maybe you as a practitioner also, is that something you would like working towards like a post-capitalist form of economy that should be based on a blockchain? Or is it rather like, this is just the next level of radical free market capitalism getting rid of all state actors and it's just money rules. It's, it's such a, that is such an interesting question because I, I mean, in the sense that I've had this question on my mind like for the longest time it's, and it, it was one of my motivations to write my PhD also was trying to work that out and I still haven't worked it out. And I think there's something <laughs> interesting. Yeah, I still have, I haven't worked it out. You know, I have, I have to admit like um, in many ways, like uh, there is a lot to be said for the way that, you know, blockchain systems and, and Bitcoin and whatever kind of propagates a kind of like hyper capitalist mentality and approach to the world. Like, absolutely. You know, you can, you see that. Um, but is that the full story? Like, no, no. I, to me, it's absolutely not the full story. I think there's all kinds of weird mutations happening and even, you know, possible alternatives. But You know, if you if you want to go deep into whether post-capitalism is possible through blockchain, I mean, like that goes that requires like some real deep soul searching around the entire technology industry, really, because the entire technology industry is deeply uh, embedded and dependent on on capitalist modes of organizing production and, and reproduction, you know. Um, But uh, there is some I do find it interesting because you, you mentioned radical markets yeah. and um 
uh, they call themselves post-capitalist, oh. which I just find so interesting because it's like, you know, kind of that for many people, the kind of market approach to the world is like quintessentially capitalist. That's like, that is, yeah. you know. Uh, what one answer would be, uh, to maybe uh, hyper-capitalism is then post-capitalism because <laughs> uh, I'm trying to, one, one thought. So, so, um, so I, I would say, yeah, of course, markets um, are a big thing in, 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 in blockchain. But also um, uh, different forms of tokens or of value. Yeah. So uh, I, I guess one critique of, I mean, of course, we wouldn't first need to define capitalism, but I guess one broad critique uh, about capitalism and what people don't like about capitalism is kind of the reduction uh, on one number, kind of, well, money. Uh, but if we have uh, multi dimensional money, we just don't have like euros, but kind of 100 different forms of tokens that represent different things or different different things we value different relationships and different people can uh, well optimize for different uh, different values uh, well you could call that hyper capitalism because you kind of have market mechanism for even more things but maybe then it doesn't feel like capitalism anymore because it's not just a reduction on one number but on uh, hundred uh, numbers or something like that hmm. okay I mean, there's so much to be said about that, right? It's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> that, uh, that would open up actually a big uh, um, a topic, but maybe we will come there in the discussion yeah. uh, with, uh, with the audience. I think one of the takeaways is that, um, and, and that's something I learned from ben Benjamin's fantastic book, which I can only recommend highly, is that uh, it's, a, it's a political question. And yeah. actually, I learned it from your dissertation as well. So um, it does indeed open up uh, new realms of possibilities, I guess. But it's very important that we ask ourselves uh, which of those we want to choose. <laughs>